Okay, so thanks. So we start. So I wanted to, to say a couple comments about the lecture on Monday. So I didn't cover very many topics. There was cotangent lines and deformation theory. And then I gave a uh, sketch of a proof of nefness of these cotangent line bundles that use the Hodge index theorem. And so there was a question about references for this. I, I basically gave the, the skeleton of this argument. If you really want to look at all the details and you have to do them yourselves. And as far as a reference, I, I tried to try to find one. I'm mean, certainly this argument is an old argument. It probably goes under the the uh, rubric of well known, but I don't know whether it's there's been written down carefully somewhere. If someone knows, please tell me. But anyway, I gave you the structure of that argument, and it, if if you want to make it, if you want to completely finish it, it's true. You have to consider something about singularities because Hodge index theorem is for smooth surfaces, but the singularities are so minor, you can just resolve them. And also the universal, uh, this family of universal, this one dimensional family of curves over the base can have different components and you have to then take them apart and apply it to each one. Anyway, so I leave that to you, but if someone knows where it's been written down somewhere carefully, uh, please tell me. So the final topic was about uh, these descendant integrals. And I gave you two ways uh, to, com to compute them, K KDV and Verisaro. And what I failed to mention is that, so these are very effective. And in fact, uh, they, they, in some sense, the availability of these methods to compute changed the subject in the sense that one can really do computations in tautological classes in the modular space of curves rather efficiently, effectively. And the thing that I wanted to mention here is that there's some computer programs that are relevant. And this, the one that I recommend looking at is this program called ADM Cycles. And there's a bunch of co-authors where you can find this on the webpage of Johannes Schmidt at Bonn. So I leave that to you to look at. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about, well, so yesterday was about modular F curves. And uh, this was in some sense, one dimensional lecture. And today we'll be talking about modular stable maps. And the dimension increases because we will take uh, the target of the maps to be any non-singular projective variety. So this is, now we include in some sense, all dimension targets here. So we'll consider maps. So, and the map will typically be called F and it'll have a domain. And the domain is a, a nodal curve as, as we discussed yesterday, complete and connected. And the genus is, uh, defined from the holomorphic Euler characteristic of O as usual. So the main thing about this map is that the domain is a nodal curve and the target is non-singular. Those are gonna both be relevant for the virtual class and the, def the deformation theory. And for the discrete invariants of the map, of course, there's the genus that's the about the domain, but then there's another discrete invariant, which is the class represented by the map. So if I take the fundamental class of the curve, you can view this class as a class in H2 of the curve. I can push it forward to get a class in H2 of the target with integer coefficients. This class will typically be called beta and it's another discrete invariant. So these are the, these are the discrete invariants here. And then the object for us today is the moduli space of stable maps. And so this is the terminology and there's the genus and then there's the beta the target, and this bar says it's stable maps. And this is a generalization of the modular space of stable curves we saw yesterday. And I just wanna say a few words about the definitions, not many. So the first question of course is if I have such a moduli point, when is this map stable? What does it mean to be stable? And the answer is it's, it's very simple. It's just, you have to look at the automorphisms gr group of this map the automorphism group of this data, which I call just the automorphism group of F and it, has, it should be finite. And so the question is, what is an automorphism? An automorphism of a map is an automorphism of the domain which commutes with F. So in particular, the automorphism group of a map lives inside the automorphism group of, of the curve itself. So if you, if you are fortunate enough to start with a curve with a finite automorphism group, then the map is automatically automor is automatically uh, stable. So this is a different way of, of talking about stability, but it does reduce to the same definitions for a stable curve. Okay, so that was rather fast. And while we're discussing the basics of stable maps, another uh, 
issue which is good to be clear about is when are two stable maps isomorphic? And that is, uh, so there exists for, the, for this, the data of the two maps to be isomorphic. What we mean by that isomorphism is that there is an isomorphism of the domains which commutes with the maps. And so these definitions are all parallel. Uh, well, there are, as I said, one can, if you look at these definitions and if you haven't thought a lot about the modular space of stable curves, you can go back and see that they agree with the standard ways of thinking about the modular space of stable curves. It's just more general. And then there's another uh, twist is that we want to put in these mark points and the, the definitions here are also parallel. There's the next, we want now to consider automorphisms and isomorphism, which would respect the markings. Okay, so that's the discussion about what it means to be a stable map and the modular space of stable maps. And it's a result which is not entirely, well, it's um, maybe not entirely obvious, but it's true is that if under this definition of a stable map, the actual moduli spaces are compact, they're proper deline mumford stacks, but they could be bad uh, from the point of view of singularities. They could be reducible, non-reduced and very singular. So in this way, they differ from the moduli space of curves because we know that like, MG bar, for example, is non-singular uh, of pure dimension. And that's not true for these uh, spaces of maps. Okay, so the first examples, the simplest example to think about are maps where this, this is the beta, beta is equal to zero, so that's constant maps. So a constant map, of course, is how do you define a constant map? Well, you have to pick a point in X where the map goes, and then there's the domain of the map, which is MGN bar in this case. When the map is constant, uh, the domain has to be a stable curve. So that's the very first example and uh, it looks like a very silly example. And in some geometric sense, it is kind of silly. If you have moduli, moduli space of maps to a point, it's just a product of the domain and, the, and X. But uh, from the point of view of, stable, of the deformation theory, it turns out it's not as quite as silly as it looks. And the, uh, the deformation leads to a virtual class and the virtual class uh, on this moduli space here is, uh, well, it's uh, some object which is not exactly trivial. So I'll mention it later. So in some sense, the, the next example um, is actually a little bit easier, but it's the, it's the one where I take the sim maybe the simplest possible target space, which is uh, not a point, the projective space. And I have maps that are genus zero maps and I map them to degree one, that's the class of the line. And why this is, uh, an easy example is because such a, a space of maps as you've already encountered it as the Grossmannian. It's a Grossmannian of lines in PN. And the virtual class here will be the same as the fundamental class. So in, in some sense, this example is actually easier. This, this degree one example is actually easier than this constant map example. And another example from the point, which is natural from the point of classical algebraic geometry, if you have that background, is if I'd look at uh, Gina zero maps with no mark points to P2 of degree two, that means they're conics. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways one can think about conics. I mean, the simplest in some sense space, so the, the, the conics are, get, are, are given by equations, quadratic equations in three variables. There's six uh, coefficients, which gives a projective space, P5. That's one of the ways to think about conics. That's not what happens with this moduli space. The moduli space actually gives the classical space of complete conics. So the complete conics are uh, a nice smooth conic like this, also a reducible conic. But when you get to the double line, the complete conics uh, pick two, that's the data of two points on that double line. And that, and that two points is from the point of stable maps, picking a ramified cover of that line. So this is just to say that this moduli space is isomorphic to the classical space of complete conics. There's some stacky issues here, which I, uh, I'm ignoring. So the, the very correct way to say it is the coarse moduli space of stable maps is isomorphic to the classical space of complete conics. Okay, so those are some examples. Oh no, what happened? So now the obstruction theory, and it's the one of the, really important 
parts of the definition is that it, the, the stable maps uh, carry a deformation obstruction theory that's two term and therefore there's a virtual fundamental class and that's the somehow foundations of uh, gromov witten theory. And what the virtual dimension of this space will be is given by a very simple formula. It's, it's given here, it's given by the holomorphic Euler characteristics of the pullback of the tangent bundle. And that's given by a Riemann rock turn, that's this term. And then I have to add to that the dimension of the domain, which is given by the formula for the dimension of MGN bar. So this, all of this together is a dimension formula and it's a pretty simple formula. So when one confronts this moduli space of stable maps, there could be a lot of mysteries, but one of the, one of the things that's not a mystery is its virtual dimension. It's given by this uh, rather simple formula. And about the deformation obstruction theory, again, I don't say so much. Actually, Richard gave some lectures which involved a, a fair amount about the virtual class. So I hope you went to those. If not, then um, perhaps you just uh, take the deformation theory uh, as given here. But the way this deformation theory works with stable maps is that there's a first the theory for a fixed domain curve. And the question is how can you um, deform a curve in a space and that's given by H naught of the pullback sections of the pullback to tangent bundle and the obstructions under H1 and there's no higher obstructions because it's a curve so there's no higher cohomology groups. And this, this leads to a, a two-term obstruction theory for a fixed domain, but we're not interested in a fixed domain. We're interested in the domain possibly varying in moduli. So if I have a fixed domain, this gives some deformation obstruction theory. Maybe it's better not to put bar because it's a fixed domain. As a deformation obstruction theory of, of this virtual dimension, but we're not interested in the fixed domain. And this is a, a wrinkle that you see on the uh, curve side that you don't really see in the deformation theory of sheaf side. So the natural way to do it is to first define this deformation theory for a fixed a fixed domain, and then view that as a relative deformation theory over the Artin stack of um, nodal curves. That's what I've written here. That's why I've tried to make this kind of a, a bold M. And you get, if you put that together, because this Artin stack is non-singular, you get an actual deformation obstruction theory for the modular space of stable maps. And this is, uh, in some sense, the definition of the stability was proposed by Kinsevich. And this argument for obtaining this deformation obstruction theory uh, was given by Berend and Fantecki in a slightly different way by Li and Tian. So these, these things are now a little bit old. I, mean, I think it's probably getting, uh, close to 25 years old or something like that. But that's the uh, foundation somehow, the, the, the very first uh, underlying uh, structure in gromov witten theory is that if you take any non-singular projective variety X, you can consider this moduli space of maps for any genus, any N and any curve class. And this uh, moduli space is a, a Deline Mumford stack and it has a good deformation obstruction theory, which is given more or less by H naught and H one of the tangent bundle up to this relative part. And using that, you get a cycle on the moduli space of stable maps of the virtual dimension. So now we can return to the constant map, the one that I said was the the um, zeroth example. And, and while the moduli space of constant maps, which is here is kind of trivial, then there's the issue about what is the, uh, what is the virtual class? And that, that is not exactly a complete trivial statement of what the virtual class is. It's not hard to compute what the virtual class is, just use this definition. The obstructions come in this H1. And it, the, this moduli space is smooth because the moduli space of curves is smooth and X is smooth. And in, in the case, the moduli space is smooth, but you can see it, it's of the wrong dimension. When it's smooth, the wrong dimension, the virtual class is the top turn class of a certain bundle. So in this case, the virtual class is the top turn class of a bundle. And what bundle is it? It's the bundle on the MG side, which is the dual of the Hodge bundle. And the Hodge bundle is the bundle with fibers given by the uh, vector space of 
holomorphic differential form. So it's a rank G bundle. That's why the G is here. So that's a rather interesting bundle on the modular space of curves. And in order to get the uh, virtual class, you must take this Hodge bundle, dualize it, and then tensor it with the tangent bundle on the X side and take the top turn class. And so the answer is you know, a somewhat interesting thing. Rahul, uh, we have a question about this section. The section, the question is, uh, what is the map from deformations to obstructions of a fixed, uh, for a fixed curve? I mean, the the way that uh, you know, the way that obstruction theory works is that there's a there's um, a space. You know, there's the obstruction space. You, you should view this as being cutting out inside the, uh, you know, in some sense that there's this tangent space, which is this, and the obstructions cut out some uh, moduli space inside it. So when this, when this vector space is large, that uh, you, um, when the vector space is too big, you view that the obstruction theory is locally given by some vector space that's H naught and the obstructions give you some uh, equations that cut it out. I'm not sure what the question is exactly, but if you want the uh, the development of this obstruction theory in general, you have to you know to construct this. Maybe the other way to answer this question is how do you construct such an obstruction theory? And this comes from looking at uh, more or less the differential. I mean, you take this curve, and uh, there's the moduli space, and it maps to X, and that the, this obstruction theory comes from taking the pullback of, you know, you take F R pi lower star of F upper star where pi is the map to M. So there's this complex and this deformation theory, the, the, the somehow the action part of the deformation theory is that uh, you have to find a map from this to the cotangent complex. Well. You take the dual of this. The deformation theory is some somebody that maps the cotangent complex of M, and that whole map can be constructed here by tautological, uh, you know, by tautological structures. If you take this curve across the moduli space maps to M to X, then just uh, looking at the differentials and tautological structures, you can make a map from the dual of this to uh, the cotangent complex of M, but it's not completely trivial to prove that it has the properties of the deformation of, of, you know, to, to, um, to check this is actually a two-term perfect obstruction theory, you have to check some things. Uh, you have to check that uh, the maps and isomorphism in H0 and it's surjective in H1. And these things are not completely trivial to check here. So the, that, uh, but in, in this case of a fixed curve, this was not done by uh, Baird and Fantecchi, but it has a, a older, it has an older history in deformation theory. So I can try to look up some references for that, but they all, you can also find them in the uh, uh, Baird and Fantecchi paper and also this tautological construction. Actually, when you see it, it seems like almost nothing's happening, but it is non-trivial. Um, okay, so maybe I think that the, 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 somehow the heart of that question is probably what is the map to this cotangent complex? And I, as I said, this comes from just looking at the differential here and pushing forward and pulling back various things. I hope that's clear. You know, the cotangent complex is like the cotangent bundle, so it, it receives a map in the differentials. Okay, so um, so where was I? The virtual class of uh, yeah the constant maps. So we discussed that. So maps to P one. So that in some sense, that the last lecture on Monday was about maps to a point. That's the moduli space of curves, and uh, we discussed the cotangent lines and up to Virasaro there. So the next, the target with the next complexity is maps to P one. So we're growing in dimension here and the map, the moduli space of maps to P1, if you use that uh, virtual dimension formula, 
it, the moduli space is the dimension is that. And then what does a general map look like? This is a good thing to keep in mind. Like what does a what does a stable map to P1 look like? And the answer is that, well, the domain, we know not so much about the domain except that it's a connected nodal curve. So I've kind of drawn a connected nodal curve and it must map to P1. So you can draw that as it lying somehow lying above P1, but there's different kinds of components. So there could be components that dominate P1, but there's all, it's also permitted that components are contracted. So the general map might look something like this, where I have some components that, that, mul that multiple cover P1 and they are attached on nodes. And then there's some other components that are contracted and the contracted components can dangle like this or they could create bridges. This is roughly speaking what, what a stable map looks like. So the kind of ideal map would look like actually just some curve, some irreducible non-singular curve mapping to P1. That's somehow the ideal map. But the stable map, since it's a compact space, has to involve some degenerations. And so there's various types of degenerations. One is that the domain can acquire a node. And the second, in some sense, these contracted components can be viewed as a slightly singular behavior also. We can connect gromov witten theory to Hurwitz's older enumerative geometry of maps to P1. And this turns out to be uh, a fruitful direction to go. And I wanted to, to just show how, how that part of the theory looks before we move on to Virasaro. So Hurwitz's older theory of enumerative geometry, Hurwitz had a theory of uh, enumerating uh, ramified covers with, with specified branch points. So this is a theory that he developed at the end of the 19th century. This is 19th century. And uh, one can wonder whether this new theory of the virtual class of maps to P1, so this is somehow a new theory that's in the, developed at the end of the 20th century in some sense. Uh, what, what is it have any connection to Hurwitz's counting of curves from the 19th century? And the answer is yes. And uh, the connection is actually is, is pretty nice. So to get this connection, there's a geometric thing one has to do. So Hurwitz, so here's P1. So what Hurwitz, the theory Hurwitz defined is you take P1 and you pick a point on P1, P, and you insist that your curve upstairs has a simple branch point of P. I mean, this is the very first, the simplest version of Hurwitz's theory. So you insist that the uh, curve upstairs has a simple branch point, which I've tried to draw like this. So it's a simple branch point. It means it looks like something like Z goes to Z squared around there. And Hurwitz, the Hurwitz problem is then you fix lots of these points and you ask always the upstairs curve to be simply branched. And then there's the genus and the degree. And if all those are fixed, you can ask how many solutions there are. That's an enumerative problem. And Hurwitz solves this problem in terms of the symmetric group. And there's some story there, which we're not going to go into today. But that's the Hurwitz problem. And you can say, how is this related to the Gromov-Witten Gromov -Witten theory? And the, the issue is that we have to find out how to get this critical point in Gromov-Witten theory, how to get this ramification point. And there's a very nice answer to that. And of course, it's going to, rela it's going to be related to the cotangent line. Because the existence of this critical point has to do with some differential being zero. And, and what is that differential? Well, the differential is a map from the tangent line of the curve to the uh, tangent line of the target. And the outcome is that if I look at this class, which is the first churn class of the cotangent line, that's the psi class, and this evaluation class at the point, this is something like the imposition of a ramification condition at P. And why is that? This is what I said, if I have, so let's say, let's call this point upstairs X and the downstairs point P, that, that if I have a stable map, then there's a differential from the tangent space at X to the tangent space at the image of X. And such a thing can be written as a section. If we have this, this differential everywhere, it's actually a section of the dual of the cotang of the dual of the tangent line tensor the pullback of the pullback of the, of the tangent bundle of P1. So this is a line bundle. And the dual of the tangent line, of course, is the cotangent line. So this differential is giving us a section of the cotangent line 
tensor, the pullback of the tangent bundle of P1. And if we freeze the point, like Hurwitz wants to do, and we can do ourselves, which is this evaluation map, we can freeze the location of that, of X, the image of X. If we do that, then the tangent bundle here becomes trivial because it's just the tangent, tangent line at that point P in the target. So the vanishing of DF is represented, represented as a cycle class by this cotangent line and this evaluation, the inverse image of a point. So this is how to get that Hurwitz condition in, in gromov witten theory. And to do it, you have to involve the cotangent line. And the very first result there is, is this is kind of an early result about this, the most basic version of this gromov witten hurwitz correspondence. Uh, so that's an old paper, which is, was written with, uh, at the beginning of the subject. So it's actually pretty easy to read, I think. That says that if you want to calculate Hurwitz's number, that's this uh, genus G degree D covers of P1 with specified simple branching. So this like zero here is about connected covers. Oh, by the way, I, you know, Georg made this comment about whether my positivity that I was writing was for connected or disconnected. I added some, some slides to the last, the notes for lecture one to help, to, I think to make that more clear. But this zero here is to say connected covers. And this is just an equality. It says, if you want to know Hurwitz number, then that's actually a specific integral over the moduli space of stable maps. And you have to have a lot of marked points. Well, that's, the, that's every one point for every branch uh, point that in Hurwitz's problem. That's why there's that so many of these. This is the branch, branch number. And then for every one of these marked points, you put the cotangent line and this evaluation at P. So in, in some sense, this formula translates old and new. There's this, this is the old and this is the new. But it's actually, well, we, we, will, we used it in various ways. I don't want to say so much about it. But now you can ask, have I proved this formula in this lecture? Because I gave you the slide explaining how to realize a ramification condition as a uh, intersection of a descendant here, cotangent line class, and an evaluation. And you could say, well, have I proved this? And the answer is kind of close, but not exactly. And that what you have to do is to show that the intersections on the left can avoid all pathologies of the moduli space. Because in the, on, the, on this side, there's no, Hurwitz is only counting these ideal configurations that I drew here. Hurwitz is counting these ideal configurations. While stable maps have, have all of these uh, more, pathological, more pathological configurations. And to actually give a complete proof of this, you have to show that the cycle on the left-hand side is avoiding all of the pathologies. And once it's in the good locus, then the argument I gave is a rigorous argument. And to show you can avoid all the pathologies, there are some other geometric structures that can help. So one of them is this uh, branch morphism. So there's actually a way to keep track of the branch points, even though the domains can become complicated. And this was developed in a paper with Barbara Fantecchi and if you're interested in that, I urge you to go look at those. So I'm not going to say much more about that, but this is a, a, an exact equality between these two different worlds. So this again brings, I should say, this also says that even though maybe we weren't interested in these cotangent line classes or they weren't here, they come by themselves because they just come geometrically. Whenever you're studying more or less moduli of curves, you can't avoid these cotangent line classes. And, and that's why the Witten's conjecture is so important for the subject, or at least one of the reasons. Okay, so. Um, Sorry, can I yeah. ask a question? Yes. How far is this formula from the uh, LSV formula? Can you uh, keep a proof uh, to? Yeah, to it's, not, it's, not, it's not incredibly far. In particular, in that paper, when one, like this paper with Barbara, which is about, I mean, certainly independent of the ELSV, you can just, if you do this, so the ELSV formula has um, not only D, but a mu here, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so this, if you want to prove the ELSV formula for one to the D, this basically gives you, uh, gives you the proof of it by applying localization to the left-hand side. I mean, th this is explained, you, only, you have to use the branch morphism. If you want to, uh, apply to prove ELSV for a mu here, then you should 
translate these ideas into relative gromov witten theory. And this was explained by uh, Graeber and Vakil. But yeah, not, not far is the answer. That's a good question. Okay, so I wanted to give some uh, examples, some, some, I wanted to say a little bit about the descendant notation, which we discussed a little bit for the moduli space of curves, but uh, we're going to now need to discuss them also now for this, the, the descendants in gromov witten theory on the moduli space of maps. And so there's a certain amount of notation here that actually nothing's happening in this notation, but if you haven't seen it, it's a little confusing for the first time. And so the idea of this notation is to use the bracket to write, for, write this integral. And you could say, well, why do we want to do that? Well, you know, this integral is a little bit more cum cumbersome, so it's slightly more efficient. But the, the, the main kind of nice thing about this bracket notation is that it builds in the, uh, the symmetries and the points. There's a SN action that acts on, uh, on these pointed spaces by renumbering the points. And for the, most, for the most part, unless you're dealing with some odd cohomology and there's some signs, which we're not going to talk about now, it doesn't really matter. So in this notation here, there's some waste in this notation by naming all the points. And this, uh, and this descendant notation here uh, somehow frees us from that. So this is some, maybe some small, some small advertisement of efficiency of it. But the way this thing works is that when you see the symbol tau k gamma, what that means is that that symbol creates a mark point and it puts at that mark point the kth power of the descendant and the evaluation at that mark point at gamma. I guess that maybe I didn't say what that is, but I should say, maybe it's clear that if I take this moduli space that for every mark point, there's the evaluation map at x, which just takes an element here as a map and evaluation i of f is just f evaluated at the ith mark point. Uh, anyway, so if I see this tau k of gamma, what I'm doing is creating a mark point and putting a cotangent line to the kth power, that's the subscript and uh, evaluation inverse of gamma. In particular, gamma must be a cohomology class. So when I write down such a bracket, well, x tells me what space I'm on. This g and beta tell me that I'm interested in genus g maps of class beta. N is redundant because it just tells me how many uh, tau insertions are there. So it's almost never put because it's in redundant. But it's not, I mean, you can put it if you want to emphasize. And then I have these tau insertions. And the, every one of these creates a mark point with a particular cotangent line power and evaluation. So that's the definition. So there's actually nothing to that. And, but if you, for example, want to restate that relationship with Hurwitz, you can write it like this. You're taking this insertion of a cotangent line and a point, and you're doing that 2g plus 2d minus two times, which you can now conveniently write just as an exponent. As a exponent. And uh, that's the restatement there. Okay. so. There's two immediate questions about this statement. The ELS either direction, the different direction, that's a good question, but we're not going there today. Uh, two immediate questions. Is there such a statement for higher descendants? Because we have here a uh, only the first descendant. This is, in some sense, some geometric interpretation of the first descendant. And what that interpretation is, it's, it's saying the first descendant is, is like imposing a branch point. So then you might think, well, if I put the second descendant, that should be imposing. So the, if the first descendant is like imposing a branch point, a branch point, let's say, is a two because it's z to the two. Maybe if I put a square of the cotangent line, this should be like putting a z to the third, like a ramification condition that z, like z going z to the third, and so on. This is a very naive point of view. And if actually, if you actually understand the geometry, in this differential argument, it's very natural to believe that with some factors. And the answer is that that's kind of true almost. So is there a statement for higher descendants? And then of course, is there a generalization of Witten's conjecture which controls the descendants for targets? So these are the two immediate questions I would say at this point. If we start studying general targets, not just the point, and then we find ourselves uh, bumping into 
these descendant integrals with the cotangent lines, then you can ask these kind of questions. And the answers are actually very favorable. The answers are yes in both cases, of course, with some qualifications. So that's what I wanted to, to say in this uh, for the rest of the time in this lecture. So there's two things I wanted to say. So the first one is about this, this question about, is there such statement for higher descendants? And I would say, roughly speaking, this means that our descendants, our descendants like tangency conditions. Where I interpret like the branch point as being like some kind of vertical tangency condition. Or you could say, are they in, yeah, okay. Are they like, are descendants something like the vanishing of the cotangent line? In some sense, the answer to that has to be yes. But can one make that specific or precise? And the answer is yes, you can do that. And for P1, uh, there's this full gromov witten herwitz correspondence. This is something I proved with Andre also a long time ago. And it more or less takes this very simple statement and it tells you how to increase the one to anything you want. And it has a very nice answer for that. But you might not be satisfied with that. You might say, well, what about for any target X? Is there some way I can exchange these cotangent lines for some geom ge geometry? And the answer to that is yes also. And you can do that in some sense for any X, but the answers are much more complicated. And this is this goes under relative gromov witten theory and what's called the descendant relative correspondence. And there's there's been some development of that. The, the earliest paper, I think, which took this problem in general is a paper I wrote with Devesh Malik on, uh, I think it's called the topological view of gromov witten theory. I'm not gonna talk about this, but in some sense, the answer to this question is morally yes, that, that these cotangent lines can be can be thought of as some geometric uh, condition about the differential vanishing in some sense. But I will tell you the theory, the formula here because it's kind of nice and simple. So that's the gromov witten herwitz correspondence that I proved with Andre. And it's best here to use disconnected domains because the formulas are a little bit better. And it, it tells you how to interpret for, uh, for P1 or in general curves, but anyway, for P1, how to in interpret this uh, descendant insertion at a point. And as I said, we already know how to do it when K is one, that's a simple ramification condition, but how can we do it for higher K? And the answer is that it's always the case that this thing translates into a certain insertion in, in Hurwitz's theory, meaning the theory that Hurwitz defined. But the translation is interesting. You have to translate it into something kind of slightly new that I certainly Hurwitz didn't know about, which is called this completed cycle. And this is a theory, this is an object in the theory of symmetric functions. And there's, this has some development by, by um, many people. And it's not my uh, plan here to give you the, the um, development of this subject from the point of view of symmetric functions. But rather, I'll just tell you what this thing is, explicit formula for this thing. So this is a completed cycle. So it starts with the usual cycle. This was the intuition saying that uh, the cotangent line corresponds to some uh, ramification condition, meaning that in particular, if you add k equals one, that's one cotangent line. It's this two cycle. That's a simple ramification, ramification condition. Or I said, if you have a two to, of the cotangent line, two cotangent lines, this course should correspond to this, uh, three points coming together. So this completed cycle starts out as the usual cycle and has a correction. And so what are the examples? Well, this is explained in this paper I wrote with Andre about gromov witten theory, Hurwitz theory and completed cycles. Uh, and you can look up some examples. So for example, the first case, this was the first case we thought about this. this if I have a, a two, the completed two cycle just happens to be just the two cycle itself. So it's a kind of a, small miracle here. And that's the reason why this uh, correspondence was so simple in the original Hurwitz case. But in general, these uh, completed cycles have corrections and these corrections are given by a nice formula. It tells you how to, how, what more you have to put in the Hurwitz theory. And this formula depends on this function, which is this cinch function. 
And this completed cycle then has a formula in terms of normal cycles. And the formula has coefficients and the coefficient is given by this blue means you look at this product of cinches and you extract this particular Z coefficient. And that's the formula for this. So this rule tells you how, this, this rule gives like a, a, a completely explicit uh, solution to how to interpret this, such a descendant insertion in the theory of curves. So this is for P1 or for curves, I should say correspondence, P1 gives an explicit rule for how to interpret this uh, descendant insertion into um, the language of Hurwitz covers. And that, uh, that translation has no complexity in that simple case, but in the general case, it has a certain complexity. It tells you that if you want to, if you want to know what this completed cycle is, it has corrections for basically all partitions of this bounded size and the coefficient of that correction has to, to do with a certain coefficient in a product of cinches. But anyway, that's the explicit answer. And this, this is the precise dictionary between the gromov witten theory of these type of descendants insertions and Hurwitz's theory from the 19th century. Okay, and then, then you could say, why do you wanna do this? And that, that's a different uh, line that leads to the Toda equations and uh, in that direction, but I'm not going in that direction. I wanna go for the part B now. Here, so there were these two questions here. Is there a, such a statement for higher descendants? And the answer is yes. And as a practical matter, I must say, to get a, get, to get a feeling for what these descendant insertions are like, this uh, language of translating them into geometric conditions is very useful because uh, you already in your head have some idea of how those geometric conditions work. All right, so then the second uh, question I wanted to address is, is there a generalization of Witten's conjecture which controls the descendants for all X? So this is a great, this is a great question. And so somehow by this point in the lecture series, you're supposed to be uh, already interested in descendant insertions because I've motivated them from the geometry of the deformation theory of curves and also the cotangent lines of Witten's conjecture, which had to do with uh, you know, shallow water waves. And now also descendants for one dimensional targets have to do with Hurwitz's theory. So by now you're supposed to already be uh, interested in the problem of descendants, but now for arbitrary targets. That means you're supposed to be interested in this, uh, in this question of computing such integrals, how to do it, or if not how to do it, do they satisfy some properties that will help you do it? Um, okay, so, and the thing that's amazing is that there is a proposal for Virasara constraints for arbitrary targets X. And this proposal was, uh, was the first part of it was in this paper by Gucci, Hori, and Shong. And that's also a long time ago, probably 25 years ago. And that, that proposal in some sense was valid for when X only had PP cohomology. And, and for the general case was a uh, modification by Sheldon Katz. The outcome of all of this is a precise proposal for Virasar constraints for an arbitrary target X. Uh, and by arbitrary here, it should be arbitrary dimension and the cohomology could be, um, can be arbitrary Hodge decomp decomposition in the cohomology. But for the formulas I'm going to write today, we're going to assume X has only even cohomology. This is helpful because odd cohomology gives a headache of signs. And also I'm going to assume it has only type PP cohomology. So I don't really interact with the uh, this other grading. This is the simple, this is the easier case. But the general case is important. For example, even if you're considering X as dimension one, you're going to quickly encounter uh, algebraic varieties that don't just have PP cohomology. So I don't mean the other case isn't important. It's rather important, very interesting. It's just as a first pass, it's maybe better not to do it. Okay, so this is kind of fun and uh, and as I said, that this was, these, these, these things were written as a proposal. Let X be a non-singular projective variety and we'll need to know the dimension of X, that's R. And then I want to pick a basis of the cohomology of X. Nothing is going to matter too much about this basis. I mean, the, the essential thing is, is basis independent, but 
to write it, I'm going to pick a basis. And this basis has an index A. And I want my very first element to be index 0, and it's the identity class. And for every element of this basis, it's going to have a grading. And since the cohomology is all PP, it's all even cohomology. And I keep the P, basically. And to write these Virasar constraints, we use this bracket language for the descendants. OK. So just as with uh, the discussion of witness conjecture and the Virasar constraints for a point, we're going to write down some generating functions. And the easiest way to write down a generating function is to write down, first of all, this formal linear combination of all the descendant insertion. So here is the descendant insertion. I shouldn't damage the formula. Here is the descendant insertion. What are all the descendant insertions? You get to pick any number of cotangent lines and any basis element of the cohomology. The, the basis elements of the cohomology, that's a finite list. So this, is, in some sense, this is a finite index. In fact, I could have just used an A there, but it's, it's conventional to use gamma A. So this is a finite somehow index, but you can put any number of cotangent lines. That's an infinite index. Now, this shouldn't scare us because already with a point, we'd seen the infinite index K here. So we're not really changing much complexity from a point from, you know, from, from looking afar. We've just had some finally, we have finally many more values for this cohomology. And then we have one variable for every one of these. So this is, a, this is an infinite, the set of variables is infinite because we have this infinite uh, possibility of the cotangent line. So this is the finite index. Okay, and, and then I do what was done before. If I want to write this generating series of descendant integrals f, I have to sum over all possible genera. And then I have to sum over all possible curve classes. This is new. We didn't have that in the case of a point because there were no curve classes. And there's an extra variable for this. And one can try to treat this in very fancy ways, but it does just be naive about it. There's a variable that keeps track of the curve class. And uh, then there's this exponential generating series of all descendant integrals. So if you think about this expression, you'll find that it, can, can, it contains all the descendant inter integrals. And in some sense, contains them exactly once up to some combinatorial coefficients. And as in the case of the point, we want to take this uh, exponential of this, the partition function. And the Virasar conjecture should be that we find some differential operators that annihilate this uh, function. And these operators are going to be for k greater than or equal to minus 1, just as we had before. And they're supposed to annihilate this function. So this is supposed to happen in all cases. So it's kind of an amazing thing. It means that if I take any non-singular projective variety, I'm going to have to, of course, know a little bit about this variety to write these operators. I'm going to give you the formulas for the operators. But I'm going to, of course, have to know a little bit about the variety to write the op operators, but not much. I can write these operators. And then this proposal, or this, this Virasar conjecture says that these operators annihilate this uh, partition function of descendants for any target x. So it's kind of an amazing thing. All right, so now the exciting part is what's the formula for this? I should say before, even for a point, there was already two special cases. There was the L minus one and L zero. This was what was called the string equation. This is the dilaton equation. And it is the case again that this, these equations L minus one and L zero are geometrically known and for the same reason. So that's the part of the first lecture I skipped. I didn't give the geometric derivation of the string equation. But I think Miguel says that in the problem session that he, he might cover that if people ask. I'm not sure exactly. But once you do that exercise, you can also do this exercise. It turns out that the L minus 1 and L0, the string and dilaton equations, are not a mystery and are, are, in some sense, from the point of view of the complexity of the subject, elementary. So the issue here is all about what happens for the question is what happens for k greater than or equal to 1. That's the interesting part, just as it was before. OK, so then the exciting thing is what is the formula for these? And that's what was the proposal in the Aguchi Hori Shong paper. And it's a formula. And there it is. So that's kind of a small formula. It's only half a page. So we look at it. So it's got formula. So this is a formula for this differential operator L. And you can see it's operating here. 
there's the partials here. It's linear on this part and quadratic on this part. And here is just multiplica multiplication by some constants. So this symbol, of course, is partial differentiation. And that's the, this is partial uh, k, oh, sorry. A k is, is this partial, partial t a k. So that the first thing is the cohomology index. The second is the descendant index. OK, so what is the, um, so what's, what's going on in this formula? So first of all, there's these lists of these differential operators. That's good. And then the main, the main things that you have, one has to explain is that uh, what are these, these green terms? And those are just some combinatorial coefficients. I'll write the formulas. And so in some sense, the interesting part of this formula is what's going on with these Cs. And this is some matrix. Actually, this is also pretty interesting. There's a lot of things to, to, to say about this formula. And I will try to say it slowly here. OK, so anyway, that's the formula. And I just have to kind of explain how to unwind it. So what do I need to write this formula? Well, I need to know something about x. So the first thing I need to know is the intersection pairing. That's this matrix GAB. And this matrix, as usual, will be used to raise and lower indices. So then there's this matrix C matrix. And the C matrix is defined by the matrix of cup product with the tangent with the first class of the tangent bundle. So I've kind of explained to you already the C. So this C is a matrix of a multiplication with the first class of the tangent bundle. And it appears here with some raised and lower um, indices. And I raise and lower them using the metric. So that's already explaining these things. So the combinatorial coefficients are uh, given by this, where is it? So there's the B. The B is given by the P, the grading, plus some dimension shift. And then finally, there's this symbol here. But what is this green combinatorial symbol? There's some integer here, and there's some integers out there. Actually, they're not necessarily integers. Bs can be half integers. There's a two there. Anyway, there's some number here. And then there's the k and i. And they're given by taking some uh, evaluation of this elementary symmetric function. We saw some of these coefficients. They, were, they came as double factorials in the, uh, in the point case. And the reason they're double factorials as well, because this r is 0 there, and there's a half. And anyway, they eventually become double factorials there. So I've now explained the green, the black. And maybe the only thing left to explain is this tilde. This tilde is, a, is what's called a dilaton shift. And it just shifts these t variables, except in the case 0, 1. So anyway, oh, I even wrote that. So this has been written kind of carefully here. It's hard to get this formula completely right. But I had long thing, I think. I had some people look at it also. Of course, one can copy blindly, but even when you copy blindly, I, often you make, make mistakes. This is a very interesting term here. What is this doing? And this has to do with a certain, this has to do with constant contributions in genus zero and one. So some constant contributions. But they're put in by hand. So there's some churn classes of uh, churn classes of the tangent bundle on X. And this, this stuff is pretty interesting, what the, what the meaning of it is. And I am not going to say so much about it. But roughly speaking, you, know, you see the top churn class. And top churn class is, of course, given by um, the Betty numbers. And so that can be obtained if you know the, the dimension gradings here. And this thing is a more interesting term. And so it's not the case that C1, CR minus 1 of x can be determined by the Betty numbers. But it can be determined by the Hodge numbers. So when you write this whole thing in terms of the Hodge grading, it's important that this uh, characteristic class can be determined by the Hodge numbers. So even, even to write this is, uh, is pretty interesting and not, uh, not clear one could do it. 
but it is true you can write it and I did I write it here but the point is this thing satisfies the Virasara bracket these these operators satisfy the bracket the same Virasara bracket that I had in the last lecture Okay, so that's the that's actually a pre very precise statement of this Virasara constraint. You take any variety x, in in the case I've said here, I made the small assumption that it has only even cohomology, maybe a, a large assumption, but anyway, only even cohomology of type PP. But uh, you have to believe me that all of this can be written for in general, and it's actually not much different. I just didn't want to worry about it. You take that variety, and then you then you uh, use in some sense aspects of its classical cohomology to build these operators L, K, and that's the formula. And then magically, this is supposed to annihilate uh, this uh, partition function, which, which controls all of the descendant invariants. So you get these relations in some sense for free if you know this is true. So the question is maybe, is this true? And the uh, kind of list of when that's true, this case is known, is uh, this is more or less all the, all the things that I know. Maybe there's something missing, but anyway. When next to the point, this is true. That's the story of Witten's conjecture, which I explained last time. In the case, the next case is when X is not a point, but a curve, dimension one. This is true. And this is a, a series, this was the, the last in a series of papers on dimension one targets with Andrea Konkov. And this proof, I mean, this, this argument uses that Gromov witten Hurwitz correspondence and ELSV and, and lots of things about ELSV since people mentioned that. So it uses these kind of things. It uses a lot of techniques about one dimensional targets. Okay, so that gives us one. And uh, then there's a different direction. So I should say that, that there, I, I mentioned somehow three different approaches to Witten's conjecture. There was the original approach by Kinsevich, the matrix model. Uh, then there's the Hurwitz approach. The Hurwitz approach actually, in some sense, also works in dimension one. And then there's the approach that Mirza Khani used for hyperbolic, using hyperbolic volumes. That's kind of three different ways. And there's more maybe, but the, uh, most of those don't really generalize in any way to higher dimension at the moment. Okay, so after dimension one, so it's a higher dimension, you need some new ideas. So one of them was this Gromov Witten Hurwitz and ELSV to get dimension one in. There's another new idea that can be used, which is actually a very powerful idea, which has to do with studying the quantum cohomology. And the, and the statement is that if the quantum cohomology of X is semi-simple, uh, then the entire gromov witten theory in the form of its co-FT can be classified using this given tall element classification. So this is the whole subject, which is not where I'm going. But in these cases where the cohomology is semi-simple, then in fact, one can reduce the Virasara constraints for these targets to the Virasara constraints for a point. And that, that this is not a trivial reduction. It's quite a compl complicated reduction, which uses the classification of cohomological field theories. But the outcome of that is that one gets a lot of examples. The examples tend to, it's, very, it's a difficult condition to be semi-simple. And uh, examples tend to be uh, things like PN or G mod P or flag varieties. But not only, there are some phonons also. You might say, what about Calabia threefolds? And it turns out that the, that the Virasara constraints don't tell you anything interesting. Maybe trivial is kind of a strong word, but they just, they don't contribute at all to the subject of Calabia threefolds. They're true, but they don't, they don't say anything interesting. And a different direction is you could say, well, maybe I take, I'm, this is too ambitious for all genus and everything. I can take a target X and I'm just interested in genus zero. And that's also known. The Virasara constraints hold in genus zero for any target. This, that's a kind of old paper by Liu and Tian. And I think other people have also, you know, so that's, the, that's more or less the state of affairs of the cases that are known, uh, the, the major classes of state cases that are known, which is in some sense a, a fair number of cases that cover a lot of classical examples. Like very often in classical geometry, you're considering maps to projector space or its cousins. 
or you are considering genus zero, or you're considering maps of dimension to other curves. And all of those cases are covered here, of course, but in the full richness and landscape of algebraic varieties, uh, this is a rather small slice. So the other point of view of the other point of view on this data is that it's known in rather few cases. And that's also, I think, a legitimate point of view. Even if you take hypersurfaces, surface of general type, faunos, uh, there are not general results there. So you can, depending on how you look at the glass, you can see, see what you want in it. But in practice, there are some examples. So I wanted to say, um, the next thing I want to do was to explain how you use this uh, in practice, but maybe I'll do that next time. But maybe, maybe I stop with the last slide to be something more philosophical. I wrote it here. Oh yeah, so I wanted to just point out that if you tell me, if you ask me somehow what's a, the, uh, one of the richest geometries and also somewhat simple that's not in the list of known uh, cases where the Ver Verisar constraints are proven, I would say the, the example of the Enrique surface, that's really a beautiful example. And the Verisar constraints are not even known in genus one. And, uh, I, I wrote a paper a long time ago with Devesh where we give some nice predictions of what, what would be true if the various R constraints are known and they lead to a complete solution of the Enrique surface in genus one. And there's a very nice formula. So I, I've always hoped that there'd be some, uh, uh, some idea that would prove the various R conjecture for the Enrique surface, but it, it has not come yet, or at least it has not come to me yet. Uh, and one thing about the Enrique surface is that it's, it's quantum cohomology, of course, is not semi-simple. And now maybe on the other side is that there's some different view of the, these Virasara constraints, which says that, uh, which is um, that, and this is true, that gromov witten theory, maybe I should have said at the very beginning, is a theory, not an algebraic geometry, really, although I've developed an algebraic geometry. It's, a theory, it's a, in a theory of symplectic geometry meaning that I always started out here in these lectures with X being a non-singular projective variety. But you can also type X to be a symplectic manifold. And for a symplectic manifold, there's a way to define also gromov witten invariants using pseudo holomorphic maps. You have to pick a compatible almost complex structure. And uh, there's a development of the full theory in that, lang in, in that generality, which is strictly bigger generality than, than algebraic geometry. Uh, meaning that there's more symplectic manifolds than there are algebraic varieties. Okay, that's good. So in, in particular, we can define these full generating series. Sorry. We can write, define this full generating series when X is symplectic. And then you could ask, well, what about this? And the mysterious thing is that, uh, the, at, the, at the moment, there is no way to define. The operators in a symplectic case and you could say well why didn't I didn't I define them here and the answer is because in full generality in algebraic geometry, you need to know the Hodge decomposition to write down. Uh, these various R constraints. I mean the whole thing is a conjecture but anyway to write them so they're sensible you need to know the. Hodge decomposition and a symplectic variety does not have a Hodge decomposition. So it is a fact that we don't know how to write. Maybe a sad fact, but we don't know how to formulate these various R constraints in symplectic geometry. And this is a very peculiar state of affairs. Uh, and this peculiarity has led to some doubts about the constraints. So it could be the case the constraints are not true. They're only true with some other assumption. It would be somehow a miracle if they were true in algebraic geometry, but somehow false in symplectic geometry. So it's a rather puzzling state of affairs. So maybe one of you will be able to contribute to this. All right, so I stop here. Any questions? We have a question. 
is it possible to generalize the Dirasoro constraints for any homological field theory? Well, if it's, um, and I think the, the answer is probably going to be no, but if it's semi-simple, then the answer is yes. Now that you can kind of conjugate. I mean, if it's semi-simple, then that you can use this this classification theorem to more or less reduce you to the point, and then you can kind of conjugate the Virasar constraints. That's how it's proven. But if it's an arbitrary cohomological field theory, I think the answer is going to be, um, well, I don't know. I'm not so optimistic about that. We have another question on, can you say something more about why the Dirasoro constraints are uninteresting for collabial threefolds? Um, yeah, well, it's just that if you have a collabial threefold, so yeah, so the way you look at a collabial threefold from the point of view of gromov witten theory is that it had had some kind of, so you're in genus G, then it has some genus G curve in it, has some maybe finitely many, all right? And the interesting thing is how many genus G curves? That's the interesting question. G and beta is how many genus G curves? That's the interesting number. But what this thing is going to be is about integration over the space. And this is a, there's no integration that's interesting. Over, the, only inter, the only integral that's interesting is this number. But you could say, well, what about the moduli space of maps with mark points? So you could say moduli space of maps. This is the picture of the moduli space with no mark points. If you now put mark points, what you get is you get some space that's not zero dimensional because now I can put, have all these mark points running around here. But they're not really doing anything really interesting. They're creating some configuration spaces. Every time I have this genus G curve, these mark points will just be creating some configuration space of that genus G curve. Whatever your name for this configuration space, of, uh, you know, I don't know. It's like end points on this genus G curve. But, but all you're going to get is this many copies of that configuration space. So what the Virasara constraints will be something about the geometry of this configuration space which has nothing to do with the Calabia geometry. And roughly speaking, the Virasar constraints will be tell you a little bit about that. And you might say, okay, that's a little, maybe a little interesting, but that already came up earlier in lower dimension. That's really not that interesting. And it's just doing that this many times. This is the interesting part and the Virasar constraints are not interacting with it. So I guess it's probably, I should say that for Calabia threefold target the the theory is not more interesting than the, than in the case of a point, right? Is that how we should think about no, it? No, it's a, no, the case of a point is much more interesting because okay. this is this is a case of a, all right, if you want me to say that, it's say like, the, the Virasara constraints for Calabia threefold are as interesting in some sense as the descendant theory of a fixed curve in moduli. You, you want, it means like you want to take a curve. Right. And you want to take the cotangent line, you know, if your curve is zero dimension, just one thing, but then I can take basically products of that curve. That's what the points are. Of course, it's not true. It's some blow ups of products of that. It's some, you know, some cotangent lines on this. It's not totally uninteresting, but it's the, you know, this is not a difficult thing. It's so you're, you're basically integrating on products of a curve. Sorry, is that enough? <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. But as I said, it's not that the co the gromov witten theory of the Calabia is incredibly interesting. It's just that this is this is just missing it, missing the interesting part. We're going to get to that later in these lectures. But it's just that the Virasar constraints tells you lots of things about a lot of a lot of things about a lot of geometrical objects, but not about Calabia threefold. You can't have everything in life. I have two uh, quick questions. The first one is actually related to the first uh, lecture yesterday so you gave us a formula for the intersection of psi classes in genus zero and that's a closed yeah, formula yeah yeah do you know any other closed formula in higher genera yeah i mean there's various formulas there's this there's a subject about this so in genus one it's a little bit harder but the way that the, the way the subject has been developing is you can ask for another thing which is that was for all integrals in genus zero but you could ask for something else which is that I say that I only want two descendants, say, you know, tau, or I could just say one descendant. 
but I want it in all genus. You know, something like this. You could ask for, this is, this is called the one point function. You ask for one descent in all DG in this, and that's a very simple answer. It's something like one over 24 to the G over G factorial, or something like that. I meant for a generic N, for generic N number of insertions. Yeah, so then you can try, yeah, so, but I, I, I'll get to the, there is a, you can then say, well, what about the two point? This is the one point function. And then there's a two point function also has a closed form. And the end point function has kind of, I mean, it's it's not as simple as this, but there are uh, ways to write the endpoint function. Like there's a paper by Andre, who Andre Kunkov on the endpoint function, which gives it as a, as uh, uh, some kind of integrals. I don't know how, exactly how you want to answer the question, but it, there, this is a this is a way the theory has gone to write better and better formulas for endpoint functions. The the way you're saying is to find higher and higher. I think for genus one, there is something one can write. Uh, usually it has some differentiation, but in genus two and higher, the way you're saying it, uh, you know, it's not, I mean, I think any one, so maybe the other way you can say it is that any particular genus, you can write down some formula. And the reason you can do that is that, maybe I should have said this, maybe this is what you're asking, is that suppose I'm interested in something like genus 17, all right? And I want for some reason to know every single uh, cotangent line integral, all of these, for any number of points, but genus 17, okay? Then how do I do it? Well, first I, 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 I tell you that what's the dimension of this space? This dimension of the space is, well, is three times 17 minus three plus N. Uh, and so this thing, the dimension of the space is kind of growing linearly in N, right? But when I look at these cotangent lines, remember, we know how to handle the tau zero. I'll use the other line. We know how to handle tau zero. This is fine. That's a string equation. We know how to handle tau one. OK? So the only, um, the, uh, the, in, the things that we're interested in are the things that, that we have to solve are tau two, tau three, these insertions. So if you look at this dimension formula and you think about it for a moment, you realize that if I only allow these, then there's only finitely many. Finitely many tau insertions to think about. So for genus 17, the way you can think about this problem is that there's finitely many integrals that have only, that have no tau zero and tau one. If you have tau zero and tau one, you can have infinitely many integrals. But each one of these eats some dimension. So they can only have finitely many of these. They're, the number is given by a partition. So one way to do this is you can just solve these by hand, however you want, by the Virasar constraints. You get one number for each one of these. And then you can extend to tau zero and tau one by some formula. So you can write some kind of rather messy formula that has a partition number of some ands in a particular genus. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but if you really want to prove something, sometimes that can be useful. Thank you. And the other quick thing, if I may, is uh, for the Witten Konsevich case, so uh, MGM bar and side yeah. classes, we have the Virasoro and we also have the KDV, as you yeah. said last time. So I was wondering this time you spoke about Virasoro for arbitrary x. Oh, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And the answer is I don't really know, but the one, the case that we do know is when it's P1. In P1, there's this, this Virasar that I wrote here, but there's also a replacement for the KDV, which is this TOTA hierarchy. So this was proven by Andre Kunkov and myself, and this is somehow the end result of following the Hurwitz line. But for P1, we have both. This was also, this, this TOTA was predicted by Aguchi and his co-authors also. So for, for P1, so for a point, there's the, this Virasar formulation and this KDV, and for P1, we have Virasar and Toda. And the higher ones, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't really know how to, to generalize this. This uh, For the higher, for a general X, you just have the Virasar. Thank you. All right, that's all I think you very much, Rahul. Are we done? Okay. <laughs>